All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 8, Section 2, The New American Republic. So recall that the um, early United States, early Republic period was politically divided between the Federalists on the one hand and the Democratic Republicans on the other hand. There was probably no other issue that divided these two sides, more so than the French Revolution, especially if we're talking about foreign policy, uh, where these two, um, two political parties divided. Uh, in France, France went through a revolution that was very similar to the one in the United States, but much more extreme in a lot of ways. The former king of France, Louis the Sixteenth, recall that France before was an absolute absolute monarchy in which the king had all the power at the time it was King Louis the Sixteenth. We'll call him the King of France. France. And uh, France had a hard time paying back its debt. Um, mainly war debt from helping out the United States in the American Revolution. France was also a society that was incredibly unfair in terms of granting privileges to certain estates or classes, namely the nobility and members of the church. And, um, you know, sort of the right ingredients came together in order for the French Revolution to simply erupt in, uh, in the 1790s. Um, King Louis the Sixteenth attempted to raise taxes, couldn't do so without calling a meeting of representatives from France. These representatives essentially um, put the king under house arrest and declared France a constitutional republic. And so at the time when France transitioned from an absolute monarchy in which the king would have all the power to a constitutional monarchy where the king would have limited power, many in the United States, including the Federalists, cheered that on as progress. You know, the American Revolution in a lot of ways was an inspiration. It was the first amongst these revolutions around the Atlantic world, and it kind of served as the um, uh, starting off point in a lot of ways. However, things got a little bit more radical after that point. King Louis XVI unwilling to accept his position now, you know, the, diminished from having absolute rule, attempted to run away. He got caught, charged with treason, and was beheaded and executed by the French people. And this led, uh, you know, the French Revolution into a much more radical phase. Recall that kings in those days ruled by what was called divine right. Essentially, God had placed kings on earth to rule over men. And by cutting off the king's head, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, almost in a sense like cutting off God's head. So with the king now beheaded, France descended into violence and chaos. The terror was mass violence in France on any, oops, considered... a quote-unquote counter-revolutionary revolutionary all right so anyone who threatened to undermine this new experiment and the guillotine which is this device that you see up here uh it's uh, if you can't really see it all that well essentially the victim lays down right here his head goes through there and uh, at the very top there's a giant blade that um, when you uh, when you pull the string, the blade goes down, cuts off the person's head, and uh, you know this person showing the head off to uh, everybody in the crowd. Uh, you know, forty thousand people in France were killed. Seven thousand people were killed in Paris. It was said that during the terror, when uh, everyone was being accused of being a counter-revolutionary and executions were just happening every single day, it was said that the streets ran red with blood. Right in Paris. So this had a very polarizing effect on the nation. Federalists who had once championed the transition to an absolute, or sorry, uh, championed the transition to a constitutional monarchy now feared the excess that was going on during the radical phase of the French Revolution. 
Uh, others, like the Democratic Republicans, continue to support the French revolutionaries and their effort to try to build a more democratic society. Meanwhile, on an international level, when the king was executed, it touched off the French revolutionary wars. Essentially, you know, everybody else that had a monarch, so this was like 1792 to like 1815, so a very, very long time. It was pretty much just France versus pretty much everyone, but namely Great Britain, right? At least for, um, you know, for the purposes of the United States. And so the question then for the United States in these wars that go on for a very long time is which side to support. In some sense, France is on the same mission that the United States is in, in, in having a revolution. France had helped the United States during its revolution, so it only makes sense for the United States to help France back. Meanwhile, Britain is a nation that the United States does a lot of trade with. Economically speaking, the United States wants to uh, be on Great Britain's side. Also think about ethnicity. Most people in the Americans pretty much are just British. You know, they were British up until about two seconds ago. Uh, during the revolution, and this has a way of splitting the uh, splitting the nation. So, for example, the Federalists during the Revolutionary War tend to favor the British side. All right, so we might write, you know, Federalists here. They want the British to win. Meanwhile, the Democratic Republicans, the Thomas Jeffersons, you know, those that really fear tyranny, that are just, uh, you know, so happy to see the French king get beheaded. Uh, you know, they tend to side with the. Um, you know, with the French in their uh, revolutionary wars. So this puts George Washington in a pretty tricky situation, which side to help, France or Great Britain. Ultimately, Washington declares neutrality, which really pleases uh, nobody, right? You know, the, the old saying. Actually, that's just really messy. I'm just going to erase that. Washington declares neutrality. We should say it pleases neither, I shouldn't say nobody, H-E-R, Britain or France. You know, both Britain and France are pretty disappointed uh, in the U.S. not picking a side. And maintaining this neutrality is going to be a very difficult position for the U.S. to maintain. So, for example, the Citizen Genet Affair. Citizen Genet or Edmund Charles Genet, he is from France. He goes to the U.S. to get support. So, you know, Washington's already declared neutrality, says the United States is staying out of this war. The French don't really care. They send Genet over to the U.S. He issues what are known as letters of marquee, which allows U.S. troops to capture British ships. You know, he traveled to those parts of the U.S. which had strong Democratic Republican support. This was known as the Citizen Genet Affair. Um, he was condemned by Washington, condemned by Hamilton, uh, yet still continued to neglect and uh, in some ways disrespect Americans, America's official position, which was neutrality. Uh, meanwhile, Washington and Hamilton look for an opportunity to perhaps get something done with Great Britain. Jay's Treaty is a treaty between Britain and the U.S. And a lot of this is some of the, maybe the unresolved issues from the American Revolution. So, for example, a lot of those Western territories in which the British had given over to the United States, recall that after the Revolutionary War, the United States got all land up to the Mississippi. A lot of those frontier posts still had British soldiers. So the Jay Treaty uh, was a way of uh, making sure that those frontier posts were abandoned by the British. So we might say here that the treaty uh, led to... British evacuation. Uh, American shipping, it was also agreed upon, would not be stopped 
by Britain. But these are sort of the technicalities of the treaty. Uh, here's what's really important about it. Two things that weren't really even specifically in the treaty itself. First of all, this was a treaty between Britain and the United States. Recall the French Revolution, right? The French Revolution is a war between France and Britain. So when France sees the United States make a treaty with Britain, they assume, and maybe not wrongly so, that the United States has sided with the British in this conflict. So one of the consequences of the Jay Treaty is that it um, maybe makes worse U.S.-France relations. It right, makes worse U.S.-France relations. And that's probably the most significant thing about it. Maybe the second most significant thing about it is what it didn't do or the issue that it did not address. And that was impressment. We might just make a note. Did not address it in the J Treaty. And impressment is the practice. So we might say this is the practice uh, by Britain. to call it kidnap U.S. sailors. Um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. So impressment was the practice of the British kidnapping U.S. sailors, essentially forcing them to serve in the British military. And even though the treaty was signed between the U.S. and Britain, British impressment continued to happen. This is going to be something that the British continue to do to U.S. sailors um, pretty much for the next, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years or so, and will continue to be a, a big issue for the United States. Uh, so you can see at least in two cases here that uh, United States neutrality is essentially just disrespected or disregarded, whether that's Citizen Genet in the case of the France, or whether that's Great Britain in the case of kidnapping and uh, taking U.S. sailors and forcing them to serve in the British Army. Now, the French Revolution had a legacy not only in France itself, but also around the world, including in the Caribbean. Um, France's sugar colony, Haiti, right? So Haiti was a French sugar colony. And of course, sugar colonies had a large enslaved African population. Um, you know, they took the opportunity of the French Revolution to revolt. Uh, one way in which the French Revolution was more radical than the American Revolution is that during the radical phase, while they were beheading people in the streets of uh, Paris, um, the French did abolish slavery for a time period. And that was an opportunity for slaves in Haiti to rise up and take over that island and create a new country. The Haitian Revolution Saint Domingue, as it was called, is the only slave revolt turned independent uh, nation or country. Uh, Toussaint Louverture, who you see pictured right here, sometimes nicknamed the Black George Washington, he led, uh, we'll call it a slave uprising. And by establishing an independent country, one big impact that it had on the United States was that it led to a fear, possibly, of slave revolts happening in the U.S., much like the American Revolution gave inspiration for the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution as a slave uprising could potentially give inspiration for slaves in the United States, particularly in the southern colonies, to rise up, kill their masters, and take over. So this led to maybe what we might call a lot of fear in the United States about a potential slave uprising occurring. Meanwhile, domestically, the foreign policy, the French Revolution, and the French Revolutionary Wars pretty much dominate everything. Domestically, there's a few issues that George Washington and his administration have to deal with, namely the Whiskey Rebellion. Recall that Alexander Hamilton got his tax on whiskey as a part of a, um, as part of a uh, of his economic program. The Whiskey Rebellion is a rebellion. Uh, 
by Western Rural Pennsylvania. Oops. Pennsylvania Farmers against the whiskey tax. And against the whiskey tax. And much like the protest against taxation in the pre-revolutionary era, a lot of these Pennsylvania farmers were using the same types of slogans and tactics, no taxation without representation, tarring and feathering any tax collectors, really believing that um, you know, the Federalists were trying to transform the new constitutional republic into a monarchy to replicate Great Britain. This was a um, you know, not just a financial loss, but this was really an encroachment upon personal freedoms in their eyes. Now, here's the big difference between the Whiskey Rebellion and another rebellion we talked about in early American history, and that's Shays' Rebellion. Recall that Shays' Rebellion in the Confederation period um, was met with a relatively weak response. Here, Washington sends a very strong response, and that is to raise uh, 13,000 troops and lead them into Western Pennsylvania to crush this rebellion. Now, no fighting actually occurred, but the rebellion was um, dissipated, right, with simply just the rumor here. And what Washington's response did was it really ensured that the strong national government would work. Right? It was more or less a test of the new nation, a test of the constitutional government, whether or not it was strong enough to deal with internal rebellions. Uh, under the Articles, rebellion could not be dealt with properly. Under the Constitution, the Whiskey Rebellion was dealt with by Washington. Meanwhile, white settlers continue to move into Ohio. Frontier violence continues to occur. Violence between Indians and U.S. settlers. We had mentioned this before, but more or less in the very early period, um, Indian policy was more or less to treat Native Americans as separate. They were not Americans, but they were also sovereign and independent. Native Americans were not Americans in the same way that French were not Americans. People in France were French. People of the Cherokee were Cherokee and not uh, Americans. However, violence continued to happen in specifically the Northwest Territory, the Battle of the Fallen Timbers. This was a U.S. victory over tribes in the Northwest, and the Treaty of Greenville, for the most part, opened we might say Ohio, the U.S. settlement. Uh, 